beginning. So we're starting our muscle unit just to refresh your recollection. That's nine A, it's A, B, and C. This is week five where the other PowerPoints were located on the cell that we completed. And now we have this. And this is the start of two, uh, to be fair, uh, relative, I feel relatively complex units once we get in, into sort of the meat of this particular structure, you know, of, of this, the physiology of this unit. So in anatomy, we did muscles generically, shapes and sizes. And, mo and, and at least the, the vast majority, probably 60, 75 percent of this unit is dedicated to skeletal muscle. There are more similes, similarities with skeletal and cardiac, a little less so with smooth muscles. It, it's interesting. To me, skeletal muscle is all about power and strength. Smooth muscle just works continuously but is not overly strong, aggregately is strong. And when you get to cardiac muscle, you have both, you have the endurance, the, you know, the longevity, thankfully, of smooth muscle, yet you have the power of skeletal muscle. And you're gonna see how they are. When we look at sort of the generic anatomy before we really get to the nuts and bolts physiology behind this. So there's a lot here. This is a, if you wanna look at this PowerPoint and download it at home, there's 228 megabytes because there's three very good size animations that do take up a lot of, you know, space of that type. So as you can see, <clears throat> the muscles where our mass comes from, obviously the transformation of chemical energy, again, transduction of energy forces, just what we were talking about with the eye, except we're doing it in opposite direction. We're not going from mechanical to electrical, we're going from to, I beg your pardon, from chemical to mechanical in this particular thing that's there. And <clears throat> generically, we will look at the different kinds of muscle, the general characteristic and the general functions. But I really want to dedicate this much more to the physiological aspect. And that's when we're going to start talking about the arrangements, the thick and the thin filaments and the regulatory proteins and the way the signaling, the complexity of the signaling apparatus that's there. Uh, <clears throat> anatomically, when you get down to the cellular microscopic level, we use sarco. Sarcoplasm is muscle cytoplasm, for instance. Sarcolemma is the membrane rather than, the, rather than anything else. Myo and mese are more often associated with macroscopic structures. Those are the three types. By definition, okay, the when we look at skeletal and smooth muscle cells, we, we do call them fibers, but and cardiac muscles, if you, if you're, I view the same way. Their shape is a little different because of the way they're interconnected. So we first look at it as skeletal muscles. So effectively, most of their connections are <clears throat> between bone and to some extent skin, they either insert directly into bone or they insert by way of a tendon into bone. And then sometimes, like I say, with our muscles of facial expression, they're into the skin with the underlying surface. And so you can generate facial expressions. By definition, uh, these are very, very long fibers, not as long as nerve fibers that we'll get to. But we're looking at something that a long muscle fiber, and a fiber effectively is the individual cell, can be about a foot long, if you will. It might be extraordinarily small diameter, microscopic diameter, but quite a lot of length. And what highlights them and where they derive their name is they are striated or striped, okay? Voluntary because we control them. The only conscious controls we have are voluntary muscle. When it comes to involuntary muscles, that's cardiac and smooth. Can we potentially lower our heart rate by meditation or behavioral changes or medication? Certainly, yes, we can. But normally we don't have, you can't all of a sudden make your heart slow down. I mean, I, I'm sure there, there are those who are adepts in certain forms of body control that potentially could do that. But the thing is with them is these fire rapidly, they're very powerful, but they, you have to have a fair amount of rest in between them. So that's what we look at. When we're gonna see striations, which to me represents power and strength in cardiac, but not in smooth. In smooth, there are fibers. 
again, a lot of times we call something smooth when we can't see it. And even if we can't see it microscopically, it doesn't mean that there aren't fibrous elements that are in there, just not visible. Cardiac muscle, by definition, only in the heart and by far and away the bulk of the heart. Remember, our heart unit, involuntary, steady rate, and that has to do with pacemaker potentials. We spend a lot of time in our cardiac unit on that. And again, it's cardiac striated, involuntary and smooth, hollow organs, blood vessels, urinary, digestive, respiratory, not striated as per visibility, can't be controlled in a lot of different words. So and it's just showing you some examples of what they look like. It's this pattern of striations that really leads us to understand this unique cell that, as you can see here, is a multinucleate. It's a cylinder, not always perfectly cylindrical in shape, mind you, but it is, it is a, it, it's a unique cell in the sector. There's probably multiple cells that form together. And the uniqueness of that means it's highly differentiated. We were talking about cell cycle, which means when you, <clears throat> like we were talking before about tearing a muscle, if you tear a muscle, it's not, you're not going to get new muscle in there. It doesn't reproduce. I mean, we, we, there are some research showing that there may be some elements, of re, but if you have a tear that you can feel on a muscle, if you have to do an operation and cut through a muscle, it, it'll heal with scar tissue. It's not a problem for 98, 99, 99 and a half percentage of it. When you damage a muscle, you don't, most people don't lose more than a few percentage points of use and power for an isolated injury. That would only affect people on a Olympic and world-class athletes, professional athletes. That's when they're affected by things like that, where the difference between being, a, you know, Olympic winning diver and not might be a certain muscle that's just not functioning at peak perfection. That's when, we, and that's the whole idea. Performance enhancing drugs, by the way, is the same thing. Performance enhancing drugs notch that up just in, that's the difference, you know, between whatever the winning 200 meter sprint is and not. That's why they make such a big deal with the world doping agencies that are there. So it's a very interesting pattern, multinuclei. There are typically single, but some multinucleated, and usually at least two. And you'll see when we delve into it, there's these almost all bifurcate, they fork. And it sets up this unique, wonderful word called a syncytium, S-Y-N-C-T-I-U-M, which means that all the cells are interconnected. So when one beats, they all be going away from that sequentially. That's the whole idea of generating pace pacemaker. And here, these are spindle and uninucleate. You don't see the visible striation, hence the name smooth. All of them have the ability to be excited. To me, that means that their membrane can, the potential across the membrane can be altered and it will respond to stimuli, be they mechanical or chemical. That's what it, so you'll get those rapid sequential changes in the membrane potentials. And eventually, if they reach a certain level, we call an action potential, which just means it propagates through the entirety of it. Because once it started, theoretically, it's unstoppable. Contractility, the ability to shorten. It doesn't shorten in the sense I could take a piece of paper out of my pocket and fold it. Okay, this is when we'll look at the sliding filament theory. You know, I'm sure in cell and molecular, you obviously dealt with muscle structure there, right? Actins and yeah, myosin, and all those, those, those guys. Basically, they're sliding over one another each other. And the actin filaments, as you will see, are holding on to the boundaries, what we call the Z-disc, and basically pulling the walls closer to each other. Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom. It's not Temple of Betham, but what is? Okay. <sighs> Read that closing in on us, you know, all those bad monster movies. Sort of the opposite if you went to Disney World and you would go to like where they had the what was that? That's like that haunted haunted mansion where you have a stretch room. You've been there? Were you ever a little girl? I have my kids on Space Mountain. I'm screaming. They're having a great time. Yeah. Are you ever a little girl? No. Well, I mean, you were screaming on Space Mountain. 
Yeah, it's because I'm I'm inherently I'm I'm bad on rides. I'm one of the, I'm a screamer on rides. <sighs> My luck is I had three children who loved roller coasters. And they're stretchy, and you're going to see that there are some protein ad adaptations or specific proteins that allow that stretchability as well as the elasticity that's there. So, yeah, movement, all that stuff, posture, yeah, obvious. Joint stability, you heard my, my thing about that last term. Does it contribute? Yeah. Is it big in the shoulder? Yeah. Are the other joints, is it essential? Nah, yeah, not so much. Heat generation, when you're cold, you shiver. Those are skeletal muscles contracting and generating heat. And we have perfect examples of this recently. And, and everything else is an organ in the sense that you have neurovascular elements as well as the muscle itself and the way that it's divided. And the anatomy is important to review. Okay. So we call, when you see a lot of this, called neurovascular bundle. Nerve, artery, and vein supplying an individual structure. We look at that a lot. Surgically speaking, you're paying a great deal of attention not to compromise that. Okay. And so the nerve, in this case, these nerves effectively are generating a voluntary signal. Okay. To control activity. A tremendous amount of oxygen is required. And that circulation is imperative because you're generating masses of waste products. And make no mistakes, with the, the waste products are the big problem. The energetics unit come at the end of this fairly long first PowerPoint series, early in the second PowerPoint series. And it's it's not easy necessarily. You have to find a way to basically make the transition from the way we typically use muscles, which is anaerobically, short burst. Like you're lifting the other day, short burst. You take a certain amount of rest in between, you do it again, how many of the reps you're doing, whatever the weights are, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. See, I actually was in a gym once. How long ago? Within six months. Been walking the dog a lot. I, I, I. Why am I getting all this abuse? You're, you're abusing me. Elder abuse. Just, yeah. Right, I'm not that old. Moving, I felt that way this morning. Uh, moving on. <clears throat> so the problem is we use, we start using muscles anaerobically until we move the transition to aerobic activity, being on that treadmill, going out for a run. Okay, when you're going, we're going to have a certain amount of time. Is is the ability to convert your usage and your respiration and expel waste products? And increase have a sufficient amount where the muscles are not so contracted that they impede the circulation so that the waste products can be reprocessed in your liver and you don't have that buildup of lactic acid and other chemical agents that are there so it's really an important aspect to look at this so all of these are sheets you're going to see a similar and we probably covered it a little bit when we looked at the anatomy of nerves and maybe we looked at this in muscles i don't recall but we, it, typically we see three layers of connective tissue. You have a relatively dense, irregular connective tissue around. If you remove an entire muscle from an animal, okay, you're going to have, and, and, and it goes by a lot of names, you know, there's, sometimes they'll call it silver skin. It's very, very dense, irregular connective tissue that you typically have to remove because when you cook it, it kind of curls up. That is there. And yes, it may blend in with the overlying other connective tissue we call fascia. So it's very, very dense and irregular. So it, again, irregular connective tissue of that very, 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 very powerful and holding and binding it together. Same is true. And in the interior, you have connective tissue that's not quite as dense, but still somewhat fibrous. It has a more generous fatty component that we call fascicles. These are groups of individual fibers. The individual fibers, which are the cell, are surrounded by loose areolar connective tissue, and they're a bit different because that's very, very comparatively delicate surrounding it, and it's easy to be penetrated 
by neurovascular elements to either blood supply, nerve supply, release of neurotransmitters, and pulling out waste products. All of that is part of it. And you see it here. So here we are looking at a, <clears throat> a great big muscle. Let's say it's a hamstring, probably is, because you're looking at the posterior aspect of the femur. And you can see it's got a tendon that inserts along there, you know, either on the gluteal tuberosity or somewhat on the lesser or greater trochanters. And here you can see the epimesium and these individual bundles that they kind of blew up here and here and here. Those are fascicles. And within those fascicles, you can see the individual muscle fiber. So they pulled out a fascicle. You see the connective tissue around it and sort of isolate. And now the individual fibers, more fatty tissue. And then the individual fiber, you can see the multinuclei, basically are a series of proteinaceous rods that are identical and surrounded by a very elaborate mechanism that allows signaling, that allows nutrition, waste product removal, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what it is. So it's, it's like the cooking analogy is this stuff you can't eat. But if you have a, a, a tough muscle, like you get a chuck roast, which are you know, to grind up is wonderful in burgers, but if you're going to roast it, you basically have to cook it long, low, and slow because then this connective tissue will break down into collagen and gelatin, which gives it that unction. It's like asabuco. You get an instant pot. Your life will be easy. You're, you're missing all the fun. Well, I, I like to eat. Now, how, I, yeah, because you exercise two hours a day, I know. I, I, my girlish figure is not there. So, other things. I don't use the terms. I talk about attachments. These are somewhat archaic. We've talked about that before in muscles and in the anatomy part of the program. In, what part of the bone is moving? Is the bigger part? Is it more proximal? Who cares? Because depending on the activity, it varies. Whether you're standing on your toes or you're stepping on the gas, you're kind of doing the same thing. But what's the origin and what's the insertion is the question. And so, and again, attachments vary by directly into the bone or the related structures or indirectly, which means by a tendon or one of those sheath like structures like you have in the abdomen that's sort of where the muscle attaches and creates that six or eight pack effect. So our view physiologically is first going to be an individual fiber because what one fiber does, they all do. The only difference is if you were lifting, if you were doing those curls and just lifting a little, you're just bringing like a coffee cup or, 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 or a soft drink to your mouth, you use very few of those. But if you've got, you've got a bunch of weight on your curls, you're, you begin to use more. We call it recruiting. So you're generating more nerves and what are called more muscle groups into the party and creating an additional amount of power. So it's whatever one does, all the other ones do the same thing. It's just how many we're using for a given activity at a given time. So we're going to first look at this alternating banding pattern of dark bands and light bands, which are conveniently called A bands and I bands. That may, and, and the A stands for anisotropic and the I stands for inotropic. You don't have to remember that. You know why? A are dark. There's an A in dark. I are light. There's an I in light. It's like there's no I in team, but there's an I in light. There's no A in light, so you know you never will get that question wrong. Ever. Ever. See? And you don't even have to pay me extra for this. A little gratuity would be appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Stein. See? <clears throat> All is right with the world. So, long cylindrical, more or less cells. And so when we get to plasma membrane, we lose the term of an individual muscle cell. Now it's a sarcolemma. When we look at the cytoplasm, now it's sarcoplasm. It's different. We have a different pigmented oxygen-containing material, myoglobin. We have different description for endoplasmic reticulum. We call it sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's mostly smooth. 
mean, these have already formed these structures. We don't need a to make effectively. We don't really need to make additional proteins. So it's a whole lot more smooth and a whole lot less of rough. We have glycosomes, so we have glycogen storage. Skel there's only two places in your body where you can store glycogen: your liver and your skeletal muscles. Period. Any other additional carbohydrate we all know gets converted and stored as fat. Why that is so relevant is when we talk about fight or flight response, how do we generate additional sugars to deal with it? We do glycogenolysis. Where do they come from? Skeletal muscles and from the liver. So, and the analogy I use all the time is if you're working in a hospital and someone has a code, whatever they want to call it, someone has a cardiac arrest, we, we pull a crash cart, okay? And there's only two results of someone having a code. Either they live or they die. There's no in between, okay? And in any event, whatever the eventuality, if they live, they're going to go up to ICU if they weren't there already. If they die, they die. Fortunately, the very first order, if you've ever seen an emergency room after a code, there's stuff everywhere because you're not being neat. You're trying to save somebody's life. You're throwing wrappers here and catheters here and tubes here and medicine and bottle toppers because you have little snap tops on the bottles and the tops go, hey, you want to get in fast. Okay. So, I mean, you have to clean up, but the very first order you give after whatever the end point may be is you, you'll assign someone, restock the cart. Our body does that. We restock the glycogen back into our liver and skeletal muscles. The liver is for all our other systems to dress fight or flight. And the skeletal muscles are there because they are the way we enact fight or flight by being able to run away or fight or do some type of you know, extraordinary activity. That's kind of how it works. Very first order. Very interesting. You need one person to write down everything because you're going to have to make notes about it. One person to use direction, maybe one or two people to do the actual treatment, start the IVs, give the injections, you know, be ready with the, you know, be ready with the paddles. And that's about it. Don't need a whole lot else. You need somebody to clean up. Crazy. Scary, but crazy. So the organelles are modified. The organelles are myofibrils. Now, this is the terminology is a problem. So remember, fiber is the cell. Fibrils are these flexible rods made up mostly of actin and myosin and other proteins. So they're smaller fibrils. If we look in, the individual actin and myosins are actually filaments. So we go fibers, the whole cell, fibrils, the, the, the modified organelles, and filaments being the actin and myosin. It's all about the names. Sarco and you're going to see what's interesting about the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it has widened structures called cisternae. We call terminal cisternae, which are wells, a cistern is a well, that are wells to store intracellular calcium, which is released when the muscle fires and is brought back in and sequestered once again when the muscle relaxes. That signal is generated by a T or transverse tubule, the big T stands for transverse, which is not has nothing to do with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, is an extension of the sarcolemma, the cell membrane, that is able to bring the signal, if, if it's a rod, a cylinder, the signal isn't just on the outside, you're going to see invaginations, indent, indentations that go to the interior surrounding the individual fibrils. And, and, and the animation should point this out really, really well, I think. So fibrils densely packed, rod-like, thousands, 80% of the volume. And you're going to see the striations, which you're going to talk about shortly. The sarcomeres themselves, which are the individual repeat units. This is when we get into repeat units, what one does, the next one does, the next one does. We see a lot of that going on now as we get into the physiology part of the program. So one sarcomere does, if the next one's activated, it does the same thing and so on and so on. The filaments, the individual, particularly the actin and myosin we spend the most time of, that have different shapes and appearances. And so myosin, I don't have any easy ways for this. Myosin is thick and actin is thick. Best I can do. Sorry. 
I can't have a I can't have a magic formula for everything. There's no E equals MC squared for that. Like pi R squared, which is incorrect because pi are round. Crackers are square. How many holes in a saltine? Thirteen. I was I once had it was in a trivia contest and I missed that answer, so I remember it. That's a, a, a true salt team, you know, from our friends at Nabisco. What does Nabisco stand for? Oh, easy. Nabisco. No, no, they make crackers. National Biscuit Company. Sunoco, Sun Oil Company. Is this going to be on the test? No. <laughs> you would think a little trivia wouldn't have hurt you. I, any of the stuff I talk about is trivia. You, where do you have children? If you don't have children already. Okay. My kids would call me up from the bar, you know, on, on trivia night at the sports bar. Go, what was Mickey Mantle's batting average in 1956? And I'd have to know that. I think it was 356. Triple crown year. 55 homers, something like that. 136 ribbies. Just off, off the top of my head. I mean, when I got the, we had newspapers. You know, you've seen them, I know, historically. Did you see that Sports Illustrated is basically closing for you sports fans? I mean, that was, for most of us, every Thursday you went to the mailbox or had to, and you want to see who was on the cover in the Sports Illustrated curse. I was listening to Peter King, you know, the NBC football guy who, who wrote for them for forever about all the different, these great covers. Not talking about like the swimsuit cover, which was, which was a very interesting cover, I, historically speaking. Just saying. And, but all about who's were the famous covers that were, and they were just brilliant. Moving on. So here we are. This is just a portion of a sarcomere. And so you can see the bands alternating. So think of it this what we're doing is we're pulling out, if this is the cylinder, we're pulling out a piece of it and looking, turning it on its side so you can get sort of your orientation. Alternating bands, nuclei, lots of mitochondria for energy. So now we're looking at that pattern. And when we look at it more closely on an individual fibril, you see those sort of blue markers that are there with the color they've used. In between, bordered by these two blue markers, is the sarcomere, the individual repeat, repeat unit. And really, our focus point is what goes on in an individual sarcomere or sequence of sarcomeres as to how a muscle works. So the striped pattern, you know, the alternating dark and light bands, A for dark, I for light. The H zone, okay, because the darkness is from fibers overlapping. The H zone in the middle of the A band, this dark band, is an area where there's a, a small gap that doesn't overlap. As you will see, effectively disappears when we get to maximum contraction. There's a midline, it's called an M-line because of the protein called myomycin that vertically runs through that. That's part of it as well. Do you have one? And the I-bands are the lighter area. And because it has a zigzag appearance microscopically, they call it a Z-disc. So you'll love this. The boundaries of a sarcomere from Z-disc to Z-disc. It's like the, the, the patriotic song from z to shining Z. From Z to America the Beautiful. Right. Oh, yeah, help me. Thank goodness. See, I when I was in Philadelphia in school, and that's when the Flyers won two consecutive Stanley Cups. And they had whatever her name was, Kate Smith. She would say, she would, she would, we didn't sing America the Beautiful, but she's saying, God bless America. And they had her come in in the Stanley Cup final against the 
great Boston Bruins team with Bobby Orr, Phil Esposito at that time, right on the red carpet because they would play her song and it was like got them. It was like the Steelers with whatever they renegade, you know, except they you know, they were doing that as opposed to the national anthem. Trivia never was in the spectrum for that because you couldn't get a ticket. Absolutely, and, and things weren't on TV. You know? I don't want to shock you people. If you lived in the New York metropolitan area and you wanted to see the Giants, which we all did, you had to go every hotel motel room in Connecticut and down in South Jersey, anything that was more than 90 miles away, was where you had to go to, to watch the games. They were all booked solid because you couldn't get into the games. Home games were blacked out. And then it was, they had to be sold out to be black, so they would lift the blackout by Thursday before game day. So here's what it looks like microscopically. Here's the sarcomere, area between two Z discs. The entire A band you will see in there, and you will see an I band. The Z disc, the I bands connect to this intermediate, the Z disc. So the impact of those I band shortening doesn't pull just one deep Z, doesn't pull one sarcomere closer together, but more than one because they effectively it overlaps both. So it's almost like a piece, half of it here and the other half over here where the A band is between the two of them. And they use, and it's a perfectly good analogy, like identical box cars that you would see. And this is what it looks like. So here's that H zone and you will see the overlap where we see the A band is where, and let's assume this is a rest, which it is, where you have the I band and the A band overlapping. There's a small area in the middle where they do not overlap the so-called H zone and the M line is directly mid, mid of that the Z discs that are there. And look here, the idea, because we, we tend to be, when we teach a class and we have a whiteboard or a blackboard, we're very two dimensional and it's not two dimensional. Okay, so you're gonna see that if you have a thick filament, it is surrounded on six sides by thin filaments, but the overall ratio, let's say, is approximately two to one, because you'll have another filament adjacent to it that sort of shares some of the thin ones. So muscles aren't just, we are, these are not just running longitudinally, they're running three-dimensionally throughout. So when you, you know, it's like when you're, when you're for those of you that work out and have muscles that fall, which are going to not. Don't start. Don't start. I know. My daughter has that too. Oh, Dan, I, I was at the gym for an hour and a half this morning. You're killing me. 5.30 in the morning, she's over at Alexander's Athletic Club in Armour Valley. No sense. But you can see it here. We have the red and the blue dots that are there. So it's very orderly. Actin are thinned. Anchor to the Z-disc, myosin, are they connected to the Z-disc yet, but not so strong that they can pull and exert a pull. That's where the elasticity, there's a molecule that they depict here in the textbook with sort of a spring-like appearance that's called Titan, T-I-T-I-N. And that's where the elasticity comes from. So again, this cross-sectionally, we see that hexagonal arrangement. So here, in areas where there's just the I band, you just see this. H zone, no overlap, just see this. When you see the overlap, you can see the sharing. M line, again, you have these, these myomesin portions that are there. So it's a really good illustration. And you, the other thing you have to realize is where you see the red, the red is a combined strand of individual molecules. So you have individual myosin units that come together in a strand-like formation. And the one thing that you can get from this that you really have to appreciate is that the heads, these things that protrude here, and they're the secret sauce, everybody, because it's the heads that are moving. The heads, and I'm sure you covered this a bit, effectively are already have energy in them, so we call them pre-cocked or pre-loaded. And what happens when they contact microscopically, molecularly, with that 
blue or thin strand on the actin, it basically, once they engage, pop, and they pull the fibers toward the midline and pull the fibers to the midline, shortening the whole arrangement. And they're three-dimensional and they're offset. Because if you're, let's say you're lifting something, you said, I'm starting to lift this, oh, it's heavier than I thought, you engage more muscles. They're detaching and reattaching. In a spring-loaded system, if you pull something down and you let go of it, you know, the old Venetian blinds going back up. Every other one. So they alternatively detach and retach. So we call it ratcheting. It's almost like you're pulling it, like you're grabbing a rope and like in a, in a tug of war. For some reason, he always used to put me at the end of the tug of war. See, that was good. When we were in, in eighth grade, we did a overnight, three like three night overnight field trip to a place in New Jersey called Stoke State Forest, which is like for natural and environment, all the, the higher quote unquote the smarter kids. Well, went there until they took all the kids. And then they buried the damn thing underwater. They put a whole, they just buried it for a reservoir. WTF. So the molecular composition to continue on. Myosin, and you, this is more biochem, too heavy and too light, four light chains, don't care. Heavy chains intertwine. So what I used to bring in, and I, I apologize for not bringing in for you guys is but for the intro nursing students it's fun is i would used to bring in twizzlers to demonstrate that it, it, nothing and I, that way i had an excuse to buy twizzlers so my wife didn't go what do you have those twizzlers in the car for they're for class i'm doing a demo just say so the heavy twain chains are the tail, the light chains are the head, and the head and they link in what we call it as cross bridging. Those cross bridging, so you're gonna see sites. And again, in anatomy, we often name the sites not for where they are, but where they're going. So you're gonna see the act the myosin active sites or the myosin binding sites on actin and the actin binding sites on myosin. That's an area where students get confused. That's an area where teachers trick things up. Because okay? you get confused. Well, it's myosin, isn't the binding site myosin, binding site on the myosin? No, it's on where it's attaching to. And they cross bridge molecularly because when they're in close proximity and they're exposed to one another, the linkage occurs. And that requires a, you know, a variety of changes that we'll go over in detail what we call the cross bridge cycle there's three components of this we have the neuromuscular junction we have effectively the transition from from electrical to mechanical energy okay so we have a transitional phase and we have the cross bridging cycle for the actual contraction that's there so you're going to see all of these things come together so here's the offsetting or the staggering of the heads and both linearly and three-dimensionally describe it the actin just like actin we talked about in the cell that makes microvilli okay are made up of soluble globular units called g actin when they strand together they become f or fibrous actin and by definition they are now insoluble so and they have active sites for myosin so they link together and form the filamentous Accident, actin called F actin, and then they twist together to form this thin filament. And I always use the analogy of double string of pearls. And those are quote unquote proteins that have a motor function. To me, the true motor protein is myosin because it's the only one that really changes its shape and induces that. Because to me, a motor protein has to change shape. That interaction between actin and myosin is all because of these two bad boys, tropomyosin and troponin. Tropomyosin, they are called regulatory proteins. The tropomyosin thread through, threads through around the actin thin filaments and covers the aforementioned binding sites. And so it's like a device where we have something that's wrapped around something 
kind of like do that, it just falls away, right? You need something to hold it in place. That's the role of the troponin molecularly. So it acts like a push pin or a thumbtack, whatever you want to call it. That was fun to do with the peel apart twisters. And where? Yeah. Oh. It's all right. When I used to do tertiary and quaternary structures of proteins, fruit by the foot. So much candy, so little time. I blame Dr. Badger. You always have candy. I know, he's the candy man. Yeah. The candy man can. The candy man. Wonderful song by Leslie Bercus and Anthony Newman. Ah, oh, their music is fabulous. They, I, no one sang their songs better than Sammy Davis Jr. Nobody. Whether you know or not, it was the biggest. He was part of the Rat Pack. My wife and I are Rat Pack devotees. We go to like Rat Pack impersonators, and there was a great group of them here in, in Pittsburgh. So here they look. Here is what they look like. If that doesn't bear resemblance to a Twizzler, what does? So a regular Twizzler or a peel-apart Twizzler? Pick your, pick your Twizzler. And so here are the heads and the offset, and you can see, and that's the so-called hinge region, those actin binding sites on the myosin. Here is the troponin and the tropomyosin here, the myosin binding sites. The tropo tropomyosin threads through and covers those sites and is held in place or retained by the action of another protein, troponin. The troponin is the critical piece because when calcium is released, when you tell a muscle to move, you create a sequence of events that release calcium that's stored within the muscle itself, within the fiber, that calcium binds to, and like any other protein, when something attaches to a protein, it changes shape. That's what proteins do for a living. Anything, they're not the same protein, whether it was one of those proteins, you know, the, the protein passageways that we talked about in facilitated diffusion. When something gets close to them, they're closed, gets close, they open, or they close, depending on what it is. Okay, this is no different. The proponin changes shape, its configuration. The tropomyosins then expose the heads. They're effectively almost immediately touching each other. It's just the fact that the tropomyosin is there. And once they're molecularly close to one another, boom, they ratchet. So other proteins help. That's the titan, the elastic one that holds the thick or myosin filaments in place. And it is attached to the Z discs. Something called dystrophin, linking the thin filaments to proteins of the sarcolemma. So there's another, it's not as though they're just floating inside the cell. There's something called dystrophin, more about that shortly. And then these other ones, the myomycin we talked about, and other proteins that we don't do into, but they're for alignment. Which brings us to, I pronounce it Duchesne, not Duquesne. Okay. I know Dr. Hill, she calls it Duquesne's, I call it Duchesne. That's my, my eldest went to Duquesne. But he doesn't consider himself a Duquesne grad. He says, I'm a pit grad. He's sort of like giving du 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 Duquesne short shift. So Duchesne's muscular dystrophy, by far and away the most common, okay, sex-linked recessive, nearly exclusively in males, and effectively the dystrophin, and when we talk about a dystrophy, it means a disturbance in growth. So they name the protein for the disturbance. And child's muscles, which look like they're growing, are not are, are effectively growing improperly and not molecularly appropriately and eventually they become fatty and deteriorate so they can't do the job and then and and really it, it even though we're seeing longer longer living for folks with muscular dystrophy uh well into much older than their 30s and that was one of those sports illustrated covers it had to do with boomer esiason whose son who's now in his 30s had that and they have a companion picture of he and his son, and then his son and his grandson together. It's just a wonderful cover, Sports Illustrated. 
So defective gene for what it's named for, the disease being named, I mean, the protein being named for the disease. And all of that tears easily, inflammation, and apoptosis. Well, okay. The sarcoplasmic reticulum itself, very interesting. It tends to run pretty much under the sarcolemma, but you're going to see there are perpendicular, when you see the diagrams and particularly animations, the cisterns form perpendicularly across from channels of the transverse tubules, which are part of the sarcolemma, at the A and I band junctions. Okay, and that's where you see these wells, and they form something called a triad. So triad, by definition, is three structures, T tubule on either side of it, a terminal cisterna. And, and effectively, you're going to see in that transverse tubule, as the action potential goes through, it generates an action potential. And what it does is it triggers a voltage-gated channel on either side. That voltage-gated channel is by basically throwing a switch and saying to the calcium, you come on out calcium is being held in there in high concentration so it floods the interior of the area and that calcium then attaches to the troponin and the rest of the party goes on from there so the t-tubules protrude within increasing surface areas you'll see with the animation continuous with the extracellular space and so the transmissions reach deep inside and here's the triad that they're talking about so the t-tubule contains integral membrane proteins that protrude into the space between the tubule and the muscular fiber of the sarcolemma, voltage-gated sensors, and that's where we're going to be very specific. This is the first area where you're going to start to see it starts with a voltage-gated sensor, then it goes to a ligand-gated sensor, then it goes to a voltage-gated sensor, then it goes to another voltage-gated sensor for a different ion until finally we generate movement. And so that's the hard part for you there's 20 or 30 steps that involve different kinds of release factors that are involved. So there's a lot of this that we talk about. So when the impulse passes, proteins change shape. The sarcoplasmic reticulum proteins change shape. When the ones in the T-tubule change shape, they're companion, they're next to each other. And the calcium, and so the, and it's a pretty good way when you see it three-dimensionally. Here's a T-tubule in gray. And it surrounds each of those fibrils, each of them. The sarcoplasmic reticulum and is, you can see, in the bluish color. And then you can see the enlargement. And this is running right along that border between the A band. Here's the A band. Here's the I band. You can see the border. Here's the C disc. So you can see all of that really pretty well done. So we'll, let's stop it here and we'll pick it up at contraction on Friday. So remind me, we're contracting on Friday. Well, it would be more helpful if you reminded me on Friday. <laughs>